Hi everyone, my name is Czech, and you guys know that from ages ago. Hi everyone, welcome to the break. Hi everyone, welcome back from the break. This is week 8, and we are gonna talk about the topic of... Um, Okay, scrap that. Let's watch YouTube instead. Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. Moving that right must, along. That must, be, uh, that must be why we're not shipping Windows 98 Absolutely. Yet. Absolutely. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video. So I think that is a good segue to today's topic, which is on software testing. So that video probably, you know, represents uh, one of the key drivers why Bill Gates is known for this quote today. He said, 50% of my company employees are testers and the rest spends 50% of their time testing. So what this tells us is basically the reality of how important tests are, as well as the time taken to implement tests versus the time taken to implement feature code. So as we always say, you know, to develop a good test actually takes much more time than developing a good feature code. All right. So other famous quotes by other people um, are also consolidated here. For example, John Goodenough, who is a CMU professor, most uh, famed for his work in quality assurance uh, in software engineering, very close to what we are talking about here in software testing. So he has this very short sentence that says, a test is successful if the program fails. All right. So in a short number of words, it actually tells us the gist of what it means for a test to be good enough. All right. See what I did there. Okay. So moving on, um, this quote by this famous person whom I'm sure by now all of us are quite familiar with. So Dijkstra, Professor Dijkstra said that, Program testing can be a very effective way to show the presence of bugs, but it is hopelessly inadequate for showing their absence. All right. So in the first place, a quote from a guy as famous as a Turing Award winner uh, targeted at testing in that era basically tells us, you know, that testing is really a key quality of uh, software testing. All right. And this quality actually manifests in one of the seven principles which we will see for software testing later. Okay. Um, moving on, now let's look at a basic classification of tests. So tests can either be for verification or validation. So if your test is written for validation on this left uh, circle over here, you are basically asking, did we build the system right? Okay, But if your test was meant for validation, it means that you wrote the test to answer the question of, did we build the right system? All right? Just to repeat, verification, verification is building the system right, whereas validation is building the right system. Okay, these are two very different things. For example, on the right circle, when we're asking the question of whether we build the right system, it basically relates to whether we actually uh, fulfill all the client's needs, right? In terms of the client's requirements. So how much does the product that we build match the client's requirements in general? So this is about building the right system for the client. Whereas... Here, for verification, we are 
seeing whether we have built the system right. Okay? So this means that, for example, whether we implemented it in the correct manner, whether we are producing maintainable code or spaghetti code, all right? So these are all uh, examples of questions of whether we built the system right. So you can see in terms of the test uh, names in here, you know, validation tests are all trying to see whether you are conforming to client requirements, whereas for verification tests, you are seeing whether you are doing the right things in terms of your code quality, uh, in terms of whether your code is robust enough uh, and performing well and so on. Okay? So, I must say that this is not like an authoritative diagram for you to classify tests, but I think it is more meant as a structured way for us to think about tests, okay? To think about whenever we are writing a certain test, what are we testing for, okay? So this is what this diagram is for. Next, let's move to the principles of software testing, okay? So there are seven principles that are commonly known, as shown over here. And principle number one, as I mentioned, is actually uh, you know, derived from the quote from uh, Dijkstra. So Dijkstra said that testing is basically you know, trying to show the presence of defects and do not confuse that with you know, showing the absence of defects. All right? So more concisely, you know, um, if your test actually shows uh, no bugs, no bugs found, it doesn't imply that your code or your program is fully correct. Okay? Um, this also relates to or uh, brings us nicely to the second uh, principle, which is the absence of errors fallacy. And what this means is that please do not commit this fallacy. Okay, and what is this fallacy? Is that imagine that you have an ultra comprehensive test that you wrote for ages, um, that tests everything from end to end that you built. Okay, this app version one that you built, it tests every single line of code uh, in there, making sure that every feature that you have created actually uh, works. All right, so after running this test and doing a lot of debugging, uh, finally, you find that, okay, this test produces no defects, so is this a good cause for celebration? Well, in fact, no, because what this diagram is showing is that your code actually is built for features that are not related to the original use cases that you, know, you have collected in your use case diagram. Okay, So although you have a really good test, and that shows no defects, you can't say that your program is uh, good enough. Okay, so this is the fallacy. Um, next principle is uh, the principle of early testing. Okay, this one should be obvious. You should start testing as early as possible, uh, even at the requirements stage, because if you start too late, we know of this uh, famous graph, Okay, which I believe has been shown in one of the early lectures. The cost of, cost of uh, fixing defects okay, is actually exponentially increasing uh, as you know, your time goes by in terms of your project. If this was waterfall requirements is here, you know, design is here, implementation is here, and then you have uh, testing uh, and uh, de deployment or production, you know, would be costing the most when you find bugs here, naturally. Okay, so early testing is important. Next principle is to know that exhaustive testing is impossible. Okay, so what this means is that, you know, you can never fully uncover every single bug, okay, uh, but if you can cover a good percentage, a good majority of your uh, code, that is already very good. Next, the principle of uh, defect clustering, okay, again, this is basically an awareness 
that defect clustering uh, exists uh, quite commonly. Um, and it's also you know, basically telling us that the Pareto principle or Pareto, I'm not sure how to pronounce this properly, this principle basically applies, you know, the famous 80-20 rule, okay, in which if we apply it here means that, you know, uh, the existence of bugs are normally in 20% of uh, your code, okay. And how you translate this to practice is, you know, basically some parts of your code are more susceptible to defects, okay, and you should know that. Principle number six is this pesticide paradox, okay. So this uses an analogy that, you know, if you use a certain pesticide on cockroaches or bugs over time, okay, the bugs would actually get much more stronger, okay, over time, uh, in terms of the resistance to your pesticide. So, applying to software testing, this means that, you know, if you had a test A to test component A, okay, this unit test for component A, uh, that is for version 1, and when you move to version 2, and for example, you know, you add more components in version 2, and you still retain the same test that was meant for version 1, because component A never changed, uh, that sounds uh, roughly about okay, okay? But as you move to version 3, and then you add even more components, and you're still using the same uh, version 1 test for component A, you might meet into problems. Okay, so this may have introduced a new bug which your old test couldn't uh, detect, but you can be pretty sure that you know a user using your app would be really upset when uh, you know component A fails for whatever reason uh, when he's using the app, the app. Okay, that affects his experience drastically. All right, so tests should evolve with your versions updates as well. This is what this is saying. And the last principle, number seven, is basically tells us that a test that is meant for app uh, for an for a mobile app would basically be different for a test that is meant for a web uh, app. All right. Note that these seven principles, I did not manage to find like sufficient uh, academic literature. Uh, that supports the validity of this being these seven principles. But I find that these seven principles are most of what the internet is talking about, the websites that are based on QA. So I, and I also find that they are good to include here for discussion. Um, so that's why it's here. But don't treat them as like the governing principles. Okay, so now we'll look at some of the main types of testing. Uh, mainly dealing with uh, the scope, all right? So the different scopes are shown over here. Um, for example, the smallest or more, most detailed level that you can test for uh, is commonly known as a unit test. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, come across this word before. And most commonly, the unit test refers to uh, testing a certain component as you can see over here. Okay, so it can refer to a component and it can also, you know, commonly refer to uh, a specific class within the component. Okay, so these are two common ways people use the word unit test uh, for. Okay, um, so as naturally a unit test is meant to test a very specific, uh, concise functionality uh, within a certain component. So for example, this component may be, you know, the login uh, view component, for example. And moving up a level is the integration test. So as the name implies, integration test means that you're testing across two or more units, in which case if we define a unit uh, just now, uh, as we said, is a component. A define a unit as a component. That means integration test is testing several different components, at least two. All right. So, for example, if this was the API uh, view for uh, you know other apps to tap onto, and this was a certain model component, okay, then you know the integration test 
would be to test the interactions uh, after these two components are being put together. All right. Next level up is the system test. As the name implies again, system test means you test the entire system. Okay. Entire system uh, test can be classified, you know, or people have come up with more specific uh, terms uh, that target different aspects of the system as a whole. All right. So there are many common types and probably the most, uh, one of the most important types is the UAT. Okay, because it deals with the user and tries to determine whether uh, your system as a whole actually matches the user requirements. That's why it's such an important test. So this test can broadly classify uh, further into uh, these different uh, levels, these further levels. For example, the alpha test, which primarily people refer to, you know, as uh, internal testing, that means testing with uh, people within your organization or people that you know. Then the next level up is the external test, okay, with the public, normally known as the beta test. Okay, so beta test is very close to releasing it to uh, the public as a release version, which means that the app is now uh, shown to the world and anybody can access and download your app uh, for use uh, for you know, the purpose of their real uh, functionality. So why is release also you know, classified under test? Because I wanted to emphasize the notion that you know, in this modern era of software engineering, that testing never really ends. Okay, So testing never really ends. And testing really is a part of your whole uh, lifetime of your app. Okay, So release can also be thought of as uh, one of the testing phases. And pretty much you can see it, it proliferates across uh, many different uh, apps as well in that you can see uh, many developers having features within the app to um, solicit feedback about the app, uh, to collect uh, bug uh, reports about the app, as well as you know having hooks in there to collect logs about how people, what actions people are using in your app and so on. Okay, so I wanted to emphasize that testing never really ends. So the next type of system test is the regression test which is basically a test set of tests that is reran after after every update okay um, and then you have many other different forms of uh, test uh, in this uh, big class of system tests as well okay you have like different things like load testing um, you have uh, performance testing uh, other names are like stress testing uh, and so on, okay? So there are many other more specific tests that you can do to the entire system that focuses on a certain aspect of the system, okay? In general, uh, after a suite of system tests, you would finally, you know, release your next version of your app, all right? I also have this picture over here to remind me uh, to talk about an example of an iOS update, okay? So... This is with regards to the regression test, all right? So commonly, regression tests would be run um, not mainly not when you know your own version changes, but maybe because of you know the version of the environment you are in changes. Like for example, the iOS environment. I remember that uh, when iOS twelve uh, back then was released, immediately a day after or so, very short amount of time, you know, bug fix version was released and then another short amount of time a uh, minor uh, version bump was even made all right so this all affects your app and most likely you would have to update your app as well okay so this updates uh, the kind of test that are being run is basically called a regression test but to make things a bit more clearer um, I have this question over here that asks, you know, what is the difference or what are the differences between regression and other normal forms of system testing? Normal forms, i.e., you know, the UAT kinds of tests, the load testing, stress testing, and so on. Okay? Because sometimes some people get confused over, you know, what exactly, how do we actually define the regression test? 
Okay, so you, you again, you know, whenever you're creating tests, it's mostly about what are you testing for, okay? So the goals of testing. So if you are trying to catch or trying to detect defects with respect to requirements, then you are creating a normal system test. The requirements can be, you know, uh, uh, either functional or non-functional requirements. But if your test that you're trying to create, your goal is to catch bugs or catch defects after a certain change, okay, then you are creating a regression test. So one of the main implications of having these two different goals is the timing that you actually conduct the test or rather when you conduct the test. So if you are trying to uh, create a normal system test, it means that uh, this test will be run when your version is complete, okay? So this means that, you know, you have completed the release uh, version 2 or version 3 uh, in which you have implemented all the functional requirements as well as implemented the required code for the non-functional requirements. And then you run a system test to uh, determine whether there are any defects with this. All right. And if you're creating a regression system test, it means that this test will be rerun, rerun after every update, all right? And these updates commonly refer to uh, things like bug fixes, okay? As well as OS updates, as well as any hardware changes, okay? If the next iPhone 12 or 13 gets uh, released, certainly you have to update your app and you have to run the regression test, okay? Sometimes OS update, okay, maybe there's no need for you to go to the next version of your app, okay? You can retain it as a 2.0, for example, but you can still run a regression test to find any uh, defects, all right? The next implication of uh, having different goals of the uh, system test is if you are creating a normal system test, it probably means that you have to do some form of manual testing in the form of a UAT uh, where you know users might uh, be given a form uh, to fill to see whether you know tests have passed, which feature uh, tests have failed and so on. Uh, there is a set of uh, steps for him to follow uh, some expected output uh, to see and so on okay so that is uh, you know commonly what's being done in a system test but some of these tests can actually be semi-automated um, you know like for example I can use a UI automation framework for a mobile app to automatically you know click on things and get results from the outputs and testings okay on the other hand, if you're creating a regression test, it almost always means that you are trying to develop fully automated tests because this needs to be run every uh, update, every small update to make sure that, you know, uh, when things change, uh, every small change doesn't actually cause uh, something major that happens in your app or even something minor that happens in your app. All right. So this is the difference between regression and normal system tests. Um, I must say that, you know, uh, in practice, sometimes different organizations would uh, treat these terms uh, differently uh, and some organizations would uh, maybe, you know, think that um, regression test is a subset of normal tests, which is totally uh, valid. Okay, so regression tests and normal system tests, they are basically this, uh, similar types of uh, system, entire system tests. But you select a certain subset because maybe, you know, the normal suite of system tests uh, takes like uh, more than uh, two days to run, for example. Okay, and then this regression test has to run like uh, every single update, small update. So it cannot take more than two days. So therefore, you can only, uh, you know, do a certain subset of, uh, you know, all the full suite of system tests. Okay, and then, you know, Talking about terminology, you know, all these terms uh, about on alpha, beta, uh, and whatever, okay, can be uh, interpreted differently for different companies in practice. Just, uh, you know, a disclaimer. All right. Um, moving on. 
This next page I have here basically tries to classify uh, the different ways how we can perform testing. In general, it can broadly classify it as non-execution based and execution based. All right. So for non-execution based tests, um, two of the most common things that we can do are code review and walkthroughs. Okay. We can start with walkthroughs because we have basically uh, done this uh, once in the review of our M1. Okay, so M1 was structured in a, a manner of a walkthrough in which we involved uh, developers, which are you guys, as well as uh, supposedly non-technical people like the stakeholders, us, um, you walking through your documentation uh, with us, and then us giving you feedback on you know what needs to be changed and so on so commonly walkthroughs are done with you know all the formal documentations like requirements design test plan and so on and walkthroughs are normally conducted in this presentation uh, manner or you know a sit around a table kind of form in which the developer would walk through uh, you know what he is uh, proposing in his document uh, for example if it was a design document uh, you know, he needs to tell people what his software architecture is um, and whether all the members of, uh, you know, his organization who are uh, involved in his product project as stakeholders uh, concur with whatever he's proposing and it doesn't conflict with anything else. Okay. And primarily to give feedback, to improve on, you know, the, the design, if this was a design presentation. Okay, so the next common thing that um, we can do in terms of non-execution based testing is code review. So this is common to most high performing uh, development teams. Like Google is uh, really well known for its very rigorous code review process. It's normally administered through a version control system like Unity or Perforce. And the level of scrutiny actually varies widely across companies. I just spoke about Google being very rigorous about, about it. You know, maybe there are other uh, SMEs who uh, do not have a code review at all, or the code review is simply checking the outputs. Okay, whereas Google looks at code line by line. And code reviews are normally done by one reviewer, you know, a developer commits the code onto a GitHub, uh, calls for a pull request, and then, you know, uh, one of the uh, pull requests to a certain reviewer, and the reviewer will just look through the code and give its comments. Okay? So this uh, comic uh, shows us a typical situation where if you had good code, you would have less of these uh, exclamations. If you had bad code, you would have a lot of these similar exclamations uh, in which can be abbreviated as uh, ways to fail. Okay, so yeah, uh, not fails, but ways to fail. Okay, so if you have good code, there's very little ways to fail. If you have bad code, then there are many, many different ways to fail. All right? So this is what it means. Okay? Um, programming assignment checklists. Okay? So this is a course that I teach at DigiPen. And although this is not like a practical or industry uh, real-world example, but DigiPen uh, is famed for its adherence to a very strict coding quality across all its programming uh, modules. All right. For example, if a student were to uh, you know, submit a, an assignment, they need to check whether the archive file, file name is correctly adhering to uh, you know, the naming convention. Okay. In this case, it will be CS280, uh, your name dot, you know, surname. Um, underscore the assignment number dot zip. Okay, so this has to match exactly. Okay, uh, even if it was a real industry, you know, there would also be such requirements because the receiving person may be running a certain uh, script on your uh, piece of code. Uh, he may be, uh, you know, requiring that this piece of code be part of a bigger uh, component and he test it and so on. So the name has to match exactly. All right. So other things are like you know, uh, doxygen uh, comments has to be correct. There must be you know function headers that follow the doxygen uh, style of uh, commenting. 
So this is uh, as close as it's, is, it gets, you know, to a real world uh, code submission, even before anybody looks at uh, the details of the code itself. Okay, so you need to adhere to good code uh, quality, even at the broad level. And then at the detail level, this is an example from our real development work, okay, for the FMLM project, which uh, we are running. Okay, so this is submitted to me as a pull request in GitHub uh, from a developer. So he has implemented a lot of different files, okay, including this file called slope detection. So it is a script uh, file asset in Unity uh, for VR, the VR uh, aspects of our project. Um, then he has these names, uh, or, I mean these variable names which doesn't conform to what we normally do elsewhere okay so i'm asking him okay what sort of var starts with caps for example um, and then there's this other section that you know he included a couple of uh, magic numbers uh, here in which there was no documentation what they are for and also we have a convention that you know if you really need to create these magic numbers please put them as class attributes in one place and then tell us what they are all right and here you can also see, you know, it is a conversation, okay? So this is this is me, the reviewer, and this is the developer. And, you know, this review process is basically a conversation for us to clarify things. All right? So this is code review. And we just spoke about non-execution-based testing, okay? Um, so the compare code review and walkthroughs, right? Uh, although they are meant for probably different things, but just in terms of uh, the characteristics and the advantages, disadvantages, for code review, it is very systematic. Okay, but it is subjective because, you know, pretty much more commonly you only have one reviewer uh, for each commit. Otherwise, uh, if, you know, you have multiple reviewers for each commit, then, you know, it just takes too much resources from your development team. Okay, so that means it's subjective. Um, for walkthroughs, the good thing is that, you know, you get very early feedback because walkthroughs are mostly done uh, on documents. And uh, the best advantage is probably, you know, it is meant to be less technical. It's meant to convey stuff to non-technical people, especially in the requirements document. Okay. The not so nice thing about walk walkthroughs is that it is commonly very informal and unstructured. Okay, because of the fact that you are running through a document and people are giving feedback uh, and there's no really no uh, good way to structure this process. Okay, um, on the other side is the X, are the execution based methods. All right, so the two common uh, categories would be black box testing, okay, as well as white box testing. So, as the name implies, black box testing means that you are creating tests opaquely without being able to look at what goes inside the box. Whereas white box testing, you are creating tests by looking at the actual code that is that resides within the box. Okay, so with that, it means that you know black box testing is mostly testing functions and behaviors. Okay, so it's commonly known as functional testing, behavioral testing, because uh, you know you're creating tests uh, to see whether it functions correctly based on the requirements, it behave, behaves correctly based on the requirements. Whereas white box testing, you know, you're testing uh, the structure, you're testing the logic within the code, uh, and so on. Okay. So as an example, here is a box with code inside the box. So what this code does is pretty trivial. It tries to get uh, the time to complete uh, a certain level in a game for a certain user, okay? So first we get the time uh, by calling this function on the user. So this, you can treat it as basically just gets, you know, the amount of time that has elapsed based on a certain user. And if the amount of time elapsed uh, is less than 60, okay, this is in seconds, then you will show on the screen the amount of time plus uh, the word or the character S. Otherwise, it is more than 60, so you will show the amount of time in minutes, so you need to divide by 60, and you can see that I purposely, you know, created a bug here, 
Okay, let's say I have a developer and I accidentally uh, press an extra zero character over, over there. Okay, and this is supposed to show the minutes. So this is the code. And to highlight the difference, um, let's look at the black box test. Okay, so this is a typical black box test. Let's say this test is part of a document that you provide uh, to the user to determine whether you know uh, a certain set of features uh, actually conform to the requirements. Okay, so, or uh, this is what is commonly practiced in, as a UAT. Okay, um, so the the instructions that are written over inside here is for the user to play for 10 seconds and then 20 seconds and then 50 seconds and then view the time shown in the right side of the UI. Okay, let's say it's a mobile app. You know, you're supposed to see here what happens. Um, and then the user is the, or the tester is supposed to see, you know, these numbers actually show up on the screen respective to the amount of time they play. Okay, so I guess this is uh, simple enough, probably a bit trivial. And you can also see that uh, probably this can be easily automated using some UI uh, testing framework uh, that actually, uh, you know, uh, creates a bot to play uh, for this amount of time and then tries to catch the uh, output view UI that allows me to check against, uh, you know, the expected times. So if I were to do this, you can pretty much see that I would be unable, or the tester would be unable to spot this bar. Okay, if we are using the black box method, because of the fact that um, you know you can't see the code, so you are not creating these numbers based on what is written in the code. Okay, and you know this may be perfectly valid because uh, we have you know, uh, specifying requirements. We know that on average, you know, the user uh, is expected to play about maybe 45 seconds in a typical level like that. So it's totally fine, you know, that, you know, the person who created this UAT test, uh, you know, test for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and 50 seconds. All right. But if we were to use a white box approach or white box method in testing, uh, we would be able to catch this bug because we can actually see this thing. But let's say, you know, of course, seeing this uh, is also subjective. Whether we can see this uh, piece of uh, error at all uh, is a big question. But any, you know, proper white box testing approach uh, would aim for a certain coverage of uh, the code over here. So like, let's say we are aiming for branch coverage, which we will see soon uh, in the white box testing lecture. Okay, then we would need to cover both of these branches, okay, both the if and else here because there's only one additional statement over here. So if you want to cover 100% branch coverage, then we need to write test that covers both of these branches. All right, and this is what we will do here and do so allow us to test for this case, okay, and try to match the correct output in which will give us an error okay because of this issue okay the point i'm trying to make over here is not to say that white box testing is superior in any way to black box testing in fact that is not true at all okay so black box testing uh, is meant to uncover certain types of defects and white box testing is meant to uncover other types of defects okay so black box testing is focused on the functions related to user requirements Whereas white, back, white box testing is, for example, focus on how you have, uh, you know, implemented the test uh, correctly without any uh, logical errors, for example. Okay. Um, and, you know, where a white black box test would shine is its ability to discover unexpected inputs. Okay, because here, like for example, if a UAT is, is run with a real user, you know, your real user, uh, irrational or, you know, a crazy user can actually do anything, any form of interaction with your app that you cannot anticipate uh, ahead of time. So this gives you a lot of unexpected inputs and allows you to uncover a lot of defects that you have not, uh, you know, even thought about. All right, so this is the advantage. It is also based on requirements. So if, if you had 
a suite of black box tests in the UAT that are created based on the use case diagram, for example, then you are pretty sure that after all these tests have passed, that you have met all the requirements to a good extent. All right. But the bad point about uh, black box tests, uh, because of this nature of testing for uh, functions and behaviors, that you can't fully automate the test. On the other hand, white box testing, the advantage is that it's able to detect implementation errors, okay, and it is also thorough, okay, if you were to aim for a test that covers most of the paths in your program, then you would be sure that you know there's hardly any errors if your uh, there's no defects shown. Next, um, the disadvantage is that it is time consuming to develop, okay, because imagine that you need to cover every path. That means you need to come up with a really a lot of uh, test cases, All right? Um, so broadly comparing the two. Non-execution based tests can be complete because if you assume that you know the document is uh, complete and you're running through the entire document, you're running through the entire code. You know this notion of testing and looking through everything uh, can be made as a statement that you know I completed that uh, look, looking through every single line of the code. Okay, but the problem is that it may contain false positives. Um, even if you look through every single line of code in code review uh, and you find that it is good code quality, without executing it, you know, uh, you cannot be sure that this is uh, good code. Okay, although here you, you define that it is good, uh, positive, but you know, it may still have errors. Next, it is human intensive, okay, like the walkthrough requires a meeting of sorts involving a lot of people to give comments to your requirements document, for example. Okay, so on the other hand, for execution based tests, uh, we have confidence that, you know, whatever tests that we have run and uh, passed, basically they are no false positive because we executed the code and uh, gotten the output for real and compared with our expected output. So the other advantage is that it can be automated and a lot of execution-based tests are automated in, for that matter. Lastly, uh, the disadvantage is that it's inherently incomplete. Okay, like, you know, it's very hard to get enumerations of all forms of input, for example, so it's inherently incomplete. Okay, so that is a broad classification of, you know, how we actually perform testing. Now let's take a step back and look at the test development process. So in the first place, why do we even have another process within the test phase is because again, you know, the software engineering definition has the word systematic. So this allows us to have a systematic way to develop our tests. So beyond this, all the different test methods that we are going to show you ex as examples are based on this process and you are basically following this broad process to create test cases. Okay, So the first step in this process is to collect appropriate specifications for what you are going to test. It can be part of a system, it can be the entire system, uh, and so on. Okay, so the specs, for example, can be the use case diagram from your requirements, the component diagram from your design, the class diagram from you know either your design and implementation, and your sequence diagram similarly. All right. So one question I have here is what level of granularity are these tests? If I were to input the use case versus input the component diagram versus I input the class diagram as the specifications, what sort of test am I actually creating in terms of the level, in terms of the granularity? That means either can it be a unit test, uh, integration test, or system test. So naturally, if I were to take the use case diagram, uh, because this entails the entire system's requirements, this would 
give me a system test. I mean, I would be aiming for a system test if, if I were to use the use case diagram to generate my test. If I were to use the component diagram, then it would be for integration test, okay? Because the component diagram shows me the interactions between different units of uh, my implementation. Whereas if I were to use the class diagram for generating the test, then I would most probably be generating tests at the unit test level. All right. So getting the right specs for what you are going to test is very important. Okay. So with the specifications of the system or the parts of your system, then you would define some testable features or rather extract some testable features from your specifications. And then you would determine what are the inputs and what are the expected outputs for each one of these features that you have extracted. And finally, interpret or rather, you know, create test cases based on these inputs and outputs. One example, so the first example that I'm going to show here as an example of a black box testing method is the method called decision tables or the method of using decision tables to generate your test. Okay, as a simple example, let's say our specifications that we are going to get is the class diagram. So triangle tester is a class that tries to determine the type of triangle given a certain number of inputs. Okay, so for example, you might have several attributes over here. Uh, you might have a method to validate the input that is given. And in particular, we have chosen this feature, which is I is isosceles uh, to test for. Okay, so the feature here given a class diagram would naturally be you know methods within the class. Okay, so for example, is isosceles is chosen as the feature to test. We would need to look at you know the specification of the feature and determine the inputs and the outputs that we want to test using this method of decision tables. And since we are talking about black box testing, note that we are not concerned about what goes in the code, uh, although we may very well even be at the implementation stage and have code that has, is implementing this class. Um, but you know, when we're doing a black box testing, we are not test, we are not creating tests based on visibility of the code. All right, we are just creating tests based on input and what is the expected output. Okay, expected output here. Sorry. Okay, so that's done. Uh, step number two: selecting feature. So mapping back to what we have seen, we are at this stage. Okay, we had a class diagram being input uh, into here. We are at this stage. We selected a certain uh, method over here. Okay. And now we are at here. We are supposed to determine the inputs and expected outputs, which is the gist of why it, this method is called decision tables, because we are trying to create a table to help us make uh, you know, certain decisions. All right. So step number three, determine the in and out using a decision table. Okay, so the first part of this task to determine in and out is to determine the in. Okay. In decision table terminology, this is known as either the causes or the conditions. All right. So we have a certain set of uh, conditions over here. Like for example, all the three inputs uh, would you know, be a valid triangle. A equals to B, B equals to C, and A equals to C. Okay, so maybe we should recap what a triangle is. Okay, so a triangle looks like that, right? Um, with sides, with sides A, B, and C, and for it to be a valid triangle, okay, it means that um, you know any sum of any two sides is greater than the third side, okay. So for example, uh, A plus C, it has to be greater than B. B plus C, it has to be greater than A. Okay, and the, for the last side, you know, A plus B, it needs to be greater than C. All right, so if these three conditions are all true, then it is a triangle. So at least that must be the case. But 
looking at what the function name is, what we are trying to determine is whether it's an isosceles triangle. Okay, so isosceles triangle means that you know two of the sides are the same, for example, 5, 5, 3. Okay, so this one would be a valid isosceles triangle. All right, and you know, if this was the sample output, uh, we are trying to match that if given 5, 5, and 3 as the ABC. Okay, and to complete this, you know, if uh, three of the sides are the same, if it was, you know, three, oh, sorry, three, three, and three, then this would be an equilateral uh, triangle and would not be what we are looking for. And if, you know, we had three different sides, Okay, let me draw that again. If we had three different sides, uh, sorry, for example, three, four, and five. Again, this is not an isosceles triangle, but it is a scalene triangle. Okay, with that exercise, uh, we are now clear, you know, what are the different types of triangle. And this function that we have is trying to determine one of those types, which is the isosceles uh, triangle. Okay, so the second uh, step in our step 3, okay, the second sub-step 3b, is to determine the combinations of our inputs, okay, and then, you know, determine the outputs, okay, or the effects in uh, decision table terminology. Okay, so first, the combinations. So determining the combinations is basically, uh, you know, just applying some math. Um, if we had four different causes and each cause is basically of a binary value then certainly the total number of combinations that we can have is 2 to the power of 4 all right so that's why we have uh, 16 combinations over here just a permutation of all the possibilities of the combinations okay um, so once we have that then we can determine the effects of each combination okay effects is the terminology uh, used in decision table. Um, this is basically defining the outputs. Okay, so go through each one of this, okay, and determine what should be the expected output. Okay, for example, if we were looking at uh, this, any arbitrary line like this line over here, if it is not a triangle, and if the input A equals to B, A equals to C, you know, once we come here, if A equals to B and A equals to C, B must be equals to C, right? But B is, in this combination is a no, it's not equal. So therefore, this combination is totally impossible. Okay, if we look at another random example, uh, like for example, this one. Okay, if A, B and C forms a triangle and none of this, uh, you know, A, B and C are equal to each other, then naturally, it's a scalene triangle, uh, as we have shown here, okay? And let's look at, you know, a valid isosceles triangle, like for example here, okay? It is a valid triangle, A equals to B, so two of the sides are equal, so the rest of the two sides are not equal. Naturally, yes, there is a isosceles triangle that we have seen over here, okay? So let's erase this to not clutter the diagram. Okay. So the next step is to try and reduce the number of combinations so that you can make uh, your life easier in terms of uh, in terms of the numbers of uh, test cases that you have to create. So as far as possible, you should create as minimal number of test cases as possible that covers all the possibilities. Okay, so here you can see that uh, the first way to combine them is to look at, you know, all the cases where it's an invalid triangle, okay? Cases like, you know, if, uh, you know, A equals to 3, B equals to uh, 2, and C equals to 1,000, for example, okay, or 10,000, okay? So you can see that, you know, A plus B is not greater than C. Okay, so therefore, uh, this can never happen. Okay, if you have a 10,000 line, okay, A and B can never meet. Okay, uh, so for all these cases, right, actually, there's, you know, you no need to 
have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight test cases. Okay, just to test that it is not a triangle. As long as it's not a triangle, all these things doesn't doesn't matter anymore because the output would basically be not a triangle or you know impossible. All right. So we have combined all these eight cases into one case here. Okay. So all these eight cases would go in one to eight. All right. Um, and the rest of the cases uh, probably you know needs to be retained uh, singularly okay because they are all unique things that you need to test for all these are unique and valid things that you need to test for all right so that's reducing combinations all right so the final step in the decision table method is to actually derive the test cases basically create the form that will be given to testers okay so let's draw a table over here um, first column we'll call it the test case name okay then we will have a column called precondition okay to tell the tester what needs to be set up before you start the steps of testing okay and then we also have to give the testers what is the expected result okay and then we may want to have like columns to for the testers to fill in what is the actual result that he sees as well as to determine whether this test passes or fails okay so for example we want to test one to eight uh, test case okay and it's probably worth putting a meaningful name here we are basically this test test case is trying to test all the invalid triangles all right but it's important for things to be traceable so we will list the exact combination verticals over here okay um, precondition tells the tester what needs to be set up before he actually starts to follow the steps to test it okay for example we say that the triangle uh, console app is running so this is something that he needs to make sure before he start okay and the steps is basically telling him what he needs to do exactly uh, to run the test so maybe first step is to enter uh, one uh, one and five okay into the C uh, prompt okay for example and step number two is to compare uh, output in console with the expected output okay and commonly expected output uh, it's easier to show in the form of a diagram okay so uh, you can have screenshots, you know, showing the uh, running of the app, you know, and basically, most importantly, what is expected to be seen, okay, in the, the output, okay. So this is the expected result or expected output. And when the user does the test, then, you know, he, will, he might not see the expected output so what it's supposed to do is to also capture a screenshot um, you know to, to tell us what the real output is okay so maybe it sees an error like that okay so this is you know of course this these two things in gray is what the tester will write down but your role as you know the developer is to create the test case Okay, or all the test cases based on okay so how many more test cases do you have to create after you know you have created this uh, first test case over here so basically you need to look back at your decision table okay your condensed decision table and see what's remaining so every single column has to have a test so you need to create one two three four five six seven eight more tests all right so you have to create a test for the column number 9, number 10, number 11, and so on. Okay, and this will be a form, or it can very well be an automated list of tests that you um, need to create. 
All right. So this is the decision table uh, test method. And this method probably is more suited to a finer grade test like what we have shown over here uh, in terms of testing a certain class uh, or, you know, in general, a uh, certain component. So it's a finer grade test for most likely, you know, a unit test. So now let's look at a method that is more suitable for the broader system, okay? So now let's look at an example that is uh, probably a bit uh, better suited for uh, system tests, all right? So reminder that we are still talking about black box testing. So the state transition analysis method is actually a type of black box test that, um, you know, suited for the system tests, but it can very well also be meant for unit and integration tests. But our focus here is, you know, on a system test. And what we are trying to generate is uh, probably a UAT on the entire system. So the first step in the state transition analysis or in any test uh, case development for that matter is to form the specifications. Uh, we say form specifications because we are going to introduce a new kind of a diagram, okay? Because remember we said that we wanted to create a UAT for the entire system. So that means that we need to have a representation of the entire system. All right, so the UML state machine allows us to create this uh, representation of the entire system. Okay, in general, state machines or finite state machines is basically you know a uh, system representation with finite number of states and transitions. Okay, so we have states here, transitions here. And over here, we have some text that tells us a bit more details of uh, how and what happens in this transition arrow over here. So in this notation, we have first the input event uh, to the transition. And in the square bracket is the condition that will trigger the transition. And after the slash, you can treat it as the output action, okay, that happens after the transition, all right? Then other things that you have in this diagram is also, you know, where an indication of where this whole system starts working, okay? So the start state is uh, denoted by this black circle that points to it. And there is also this black circle with a ring, okay, which tells us how the system is going to end okay, or where the system is going to end. All right? So this gives us a way to represent the entire system. And also just to uh, be clear, you know, this state is actually the state of your whole uh, system. Okay? So any one state over here is an abstract state of the whole system. Okay, so once you have this specification of the entire system, the second step over here in our uh, test case development process is to select the features. Okay, so for example, I select this feature. I mean, in the end, for the test to be completed, we have to do all transitions. Okay, but for this particular test case that we are targeting as an example is that we will select this feature over here and develop a test case for it. Okay, so this feature basically tells us that, okay, the input event for this transition is login username, okay? And for this transition to fire, the login username is not valid and the number of tries is greater than five, okay? So this is basically telling us that, that the username tries to log in five times and all five times is invalid. Then the output action would be to show a bar message to the user, okay? And the landing uh, state of the system is that the system will show a bar screen, okay? So now we should determine the inputs and outputs, which I've actually just described. So the input would be that, you know, for this test case we're going to develop is that it is not valid username and you know it is greater than five tries and the expected output would naturally be the 
output action of the transition and you know also which state the user should be in. And in terms of expected output, what the user should see in terms of uh, the state that is going to be the result. All right. So we have determined the input and the output. We can now derive the test uh, cases. Okay. So similarly, let's draw the table that. But here uh, for the UAT for the entire system. Okay, so let's give a meaningful name and let's give an arbitrary number to our uh, our transition as well. Okay, so this is test case one, and what we are testing is basically invalid uh, login uh, with five greater than five attempts. Okay, so give something meaningful as the title. Okay, some succinct description of um, the input characteristics is normally how we would uh, label the test case. Okay, so the precondition would be that I am in the splash screen, right? So if we look at here, yeah, the precondition is that I should be in the splash screen before I start the test. So maybe I will give a screenshot of, uh, you know, the splash screen. Okay, and the steps I need to take or the tester needs to take is first, he needs to enter uh, maybe some arbitrary name. Okay, I uh, hate uh, check, for example. Okay, and two is to see the word invalid user name. Sorry, I'll just abbreviate things here on the screen okay and step number three is i want to do it i want the user to do it five times right so i'll just say repeat one uh, and two five times okay so that would give me six times right so because here and here is one time and i do it five more times will give me six times which is greater than five times which will satisfy uh, you know, the invalid uh, login. And the last step is that I need to make sure that the user observes uh, the screen and compare uh, this screen, okay, this screen with the expected output, okay, which is here. All right. So for the expected uh, output or expected result, um, what the users you expect to see is probably uh, you are barred, okay, on the screen, okay. So this is basically uh, this show barred message uh, output over here as the result of the transition, okay, and secondly. He should also see the where is the resultant state that you should be in. Okay, so you should also see. So let's complete this statement. See you are about on screen as well as you know after that you would see your uh, mobile view uh, changed to that bar screen. Okay, so maybe it's just another screenshot um, of uh, a bar screen. Okay. And so the user would then, you know, fill in stuff in the actual test and so on. All right. So this is how you would create a system UAT test using a system UML state diagram. All right. And didn't uh, look at this part, uh, which is basically telling us that the state diagram, how you generate the state diagram, uh, depends on you know what you have on hand. Most likely, a combination of these things. Um, that allow you to generate this state diagram. All right. As a final thing that you would do uh, for this week's uh, content learning purposes is probably you may want to you know Google the black box uh, methods. Okay, black box testing methods, um, and one of 
a common method that uh, you know is being mentioned is probably the boundary value analysis which you know you should go and look at this video uh, from Udacity posted on YouTube as well okay so that you get an idea what boundary value analysis is so if you google black box testing methods you probably find a large variety of different things uh, different methods or parts of methods uh, you know that you can use when you're creating black box tests all right so i just wanted to say that uh, a lot of these methods are not standalone and you can mix and match some of these things with uh, other methods um, and that is what commonly is being done so it's just good to know uh, a span of different types of things that people commonly uh, use when creating black box tests all right so with that uh, enjoy so with that enjoy the rest of the week and i will see you in lecture and so with that enjoy so with that i will see you in labs bye Okay, scrap that. Let's watch YouTube instead.